He made us gods. It's the freedom. It's what you can do. I mean, you can be good, you can be bad. You can do what you want. It's, it's a little playground. I kind of feel pretty powerful. That was the moment, of course. That's what you are. You're God. And let us soar to new heights. The magic carpet gives you a full sense of just freedom. We all love that. We love the idea of just being able to go anywhere and do anything. Peter sensibly tapped right into that. Although he would struggle along the way. He literally was the archetypal sort of um, struggling artist. His originality paved the way for others. Peter likes to push the boundaries. Sometimes you think, my god, how are we going to achieve these things? This is the story of one of gaming's biggest innovators. This is the story of Peter Molyneux. Before computers were a blip on the horizon, a young Peter Molyneux learns how to play by his own rules. Peter's parents play an early role in shaping his future career. My mother ran this toy shop, and that sounds, you know, wonderful being a kid. You think you would have every, every single toy known to man. Actually, what it meant is we got all the things that were broken, that people didn't want to buy. So we got lots of games without rules in, or Monopoly sets without money, so you just sort of, sort of had to kind of make up the rules. I think that, that had a big, uh, a big effect. Peter also sees the value of running his own business. When I was 12 years old, I employed my sister and all her friends to cut people's lawns while I just sat there and watched, which was great. And I paid them about, you know, a cent an hour and then collected a dollar. Peter's business sense leads him to start his first company in the exploding market of computer sales. I came up with this really, really dumb idea. If we could sell floppy disks, on these floppy disks would be some free stuff, like maybe a free game. It was such a stupid idea, because no one really wanted floppy disks with loads of stuff on there. If they wanted floppy disks, they wanted floppy disks that were blank. And what I found was that people were paying more attention to the software on these disks than anything else. And that realization is all Peter needs to put himself on track to designing his first game. And in those days, you know, you only had to make a game which you could shoot things. You know what you shot, and it would pretty much well be successful. But I decided instead to do a business game called The Entrepreneur. Peter's first foray into gaming is less successful than he hoped. And I was so completely convinced that this was going to be a great, amazing game that I phoned up the post office and said, I'm expecting a lot of post. I've cut a bigger post box in front of my front door. I sat by the, the post box waiting to hear this truck turn up with, you know, tens of thousands of orders. But instead, these two envelopes came fluttering through the door. And both of them had orders on. And I'm pretty sure they were both from my mother. And that was the sum total of orders that I, I received for that game. And a spelling mistake gives Peter the tools he needs to start making games full time. I then started up another company called Taurus. And there was this phone call from this company called Commodore and said, you know, we've heard about your company and we're really impressed with it. And we'd like you to come on over and we'd like to present our uh, machine to you and see what you think of it because we'd love your product on our machine. I thought that's just fantastic. They gave me absolutely the red carpet treatment. They took me out to lunch, demoed the machine to us, said, well, you know, we really want to convince you to put your product on our machine. And then it came to the end of the day, this guy said, um, just when will your network be uh, available? And it suddenly occurred to me that our company was called Taurus, spelt like the star sign, and there was this other company called Taurus, spelt like the donut. I can still remember it vividly. Going through my head, there was like an angel and a devil on my shoulders, and one saying, go on, you've just got to tell the truth. You know, you can't lie like this. And then this other voice saying, just lie. Just lie, get the machines, go to the stand space, and just sort it out afterwards. Of course, I ended up lying and saying, yeah, we're going to have the network working in a couple of months' time. 
we then made the step into making games. In 1987, Peter founds a new company to focus on making games and calls it Bullfrog. But making a hit game proves to be difficult. Yeah, I first met Peter when I was about 15 years old. He was really poor, actually. He was really... <laughs> we were really running out of money. He'd have this sort of the same shirt on every day and he'd be hunched over his computer with a, with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth and there'd be cigarette ash all over his computer. We couldn't really afford the rent. He literally was the archetypal sort of um, struggling artist. He was really just trying to get off the ground and, and his business was, was struggling at the time. This game was slowly coming together. It started off with this landscape. You know, the next thing I thought, well, why don't we put some people on this landscape? So we had these little people moving around. And the next thing I thought was, why don't we have them building their own little houses? And that was fine. Populous was born out of my incompetence as a programmer. This is the absolute truth of it. Because I couldn't work out a routine to automatically flatten the land so that little people could build a big enough house. So I thought, why don't I just get the player to flatten the land? So I had them just build a little land and just wander around the shore. And that gave rise to the, this thing called exploration that they could explore. And that was because I wasn't smart enough to do, to do the code. We played it and there was this feeling that, hey, we're just moving the land up and down and I kind of feel pretty powerful, you know, I can sink people in the water and I can, you know, chuck them out of the house and, you know, I feel a bit godly. And then that was the moment, of course, that's what you are, you're a god. It's definitely the freedom. It's what you can do. I mean, you can be good, you can be bad, you can uh, you can do what you want. It's, it's a little playground. As the game gets close to finishing, word begins to spread. When this magazine phoned us up and said, look, we'd like our this editor called Bob Wade to come down, and he was one of these superstar journalists in the in computer industry. He wants to come down and meet you. He's looked populous. So we went down to the pub. So I brought him loads of drinks. We had lots and lots of drinks. And eventually, after about 10 pints, I, I plucked up courage and said, what do you think of Populous? And he said, it's the best game I've ever played. Though only one thought went through my mind, he must never play the game again because he'll change his mind. But will the gaming world respond as well to such an unusual title? We got rejected by quite a lot of publishers. In 1989, Peter Molyneux's fledgling company, Bullfrog, struggles to convince publishers to take a chance on the unusual populace. The way we convinced Electronic Arts was to get them down and to get them to play the game. And I think they started to see a glimpse of what the game could be. And then, eventually, they released the game. On June 1st, 1989, Electronic Arts releases Populous, and word spreads quickly about the game. And I got this phone call three weeks after it was released from one of the chief people at Electronic Arts. And he said, um, how's it feel to be a millionaire? It just seemed like suddenly there was this whole completely different world unfolding. Critics and fans can't get enough of the highly original game. One of my uh, memories from college is a friend of mine coming up to me and saying, there's this game called Populous. You must see it. It is the greatest game I have ever seen. And I played Populous like, this is the greatest game I've ever seen. You know, it innovated a whole genre. I mean, the God game comes from Populous. While that game was fairly simple in design, the idea has gone on and multiplied. Like, everything, I think, kind of owes something to Populous. But Peter realizes that success can sometimes bring pressures of a different kind. Suddenly, everyone turned around and said, what are you going to do next? And our publisher, Electronic Arts, said, look, it'd be really great if you could get your next game out by Christmas. This was, we were at March at that time. So I had this idea for a game called Powermonger, but it was such an enormous amount of pressure to get that game finished that actually I made the fatal mistake of having a good idea, programming that idea up, and actually releasing it without ever really playing it. Despite the hectic release schedule, the game does reasonably well, and Peter gains a reputation as an innovative designer. We had won tons of awards for Populous for Powermonger. Populous 2. I mean, that is an incredible feeling in a company. You know, this feeling of success, a feeling that we, we as a company were going somewhere. And I think it gave us all 
a confidence. The success of their first three games allows Bullfrog to begin work on several new titles at once, including a game that lets you pilot your own magic carpet. Magic Carpet is one of the, the early games that really gives you a full sense of just freedom. We love the idea of just being able to go anywhere and do anything. Peter sensibly tapped right into that and, you know, knew that that's what people want to do. Theme Park. And the sci-fi Syndicate. Syndicate was another really, really successful game. It was pretty violent. It was about this group of people that you controlled that went around a city battling against other groups of people. With a string of hits under Bullfrog's belt, publishers start sniffing around their offices. One day, the phone started to ring, and there were all these big, big companies saying, look, if you ever want to sell your company, we're really interested in buying it. We're going to take you out to, to dinner, or we're going to fly you to this resort. And it was like being a rock star. Peter decides to sell Bullfrog to the company that took a chance on Populous. And in February of 1995, they join Electronic Arts. We decided to sell the company for two big reasons. The first reason, I have to be absolutely honest about, it was a vast sum of money. The other thing was this group of people were getting a little bit impatient. You know, there was nowhere for them, to, lots of them to grow. They wanted to feel like there was more than this, this little company that, that was in. So selling out to Electron Cars, who were really, really passionate about the games that we, we made, just seemed like the, really the right thing to do. Along with the change in ownership comes a new title for Peter. Part of the deal was that I became a vice president of Electron Cars. Suddenly, the pressure is on the recently acquired Bullfrog to prove their worth. In the next few years, Bullfrog releases several new hit titles, a hospital simulation called Theme Hospital, and a return to the future in Syndicate Wars. And soon, work begins on a new game that turns a familiar genre on its head. Now, Dungeon Keeper was a game where you played the bad guy. It was one of my favorite ideas. Peter learns that his gift is building worlds and not businesses. I got pretty frustrated after a little while. Frustrated that I was not actually sitting behind a computer anymore. I was sitting in meeting rooms. And so about two years later, I said to myself, well, you know, I'm just not enjoying as much as I did before because I'm not doing the thing I'm passionate about. I want to just focus on making great, fantastic games. Peter puts all his efforts into finishing Dungeon Keeper. As the game creeps past its original delivery date, EA questions whether it wants to continue with the production. Peter responds by making a personal investment in the project. I will finish Dungeon Keeper from my home and with a small team of people, and we'll, do, we'll just finish the game. That's exactly what we did do, and it was pretty tough at that time. When you're developing a game, you'll often run into a problem where the money may go away. And you have to decide at that point, do I believe in this project enough to fund it myself? We were locked up in his house for a period of time. And what we do with Dungeon Keeper, we had great fun because we'd play it against each other in the night. OK, Peter say, ah, oh, it's a design flaw when he lost and changed the game, so it was altered around that. Electronic Arts releases Dungeon Keeper on June 26, 1997. And once again, the game is a hit for Bullfrog. You have conquered this realm. Despite Bullfrog's success, Peter decides to hop out on his own. I went to the president of Electronic Arts and I said, look, this is my problem. You know, I'm not doing the job I love. I can either go back to being a designer, which was taking this huge step backwards, or I could leave set up another company and publish my games through Electronic Arts. And that is exactly what uh, I did. When you first hear that he's leaving A, you go like, you know, they're losing, you know, a visionary. But at the same time, uh, I can see why he would want to go back to kind of his roots of having a smaller company. That's the kind of environment he thrives in, where there's a lot more innovation and kind of family, I think, values going on there. With the success of Dungeon Keeper, Peter leaves behind the company he helped create. Once again, the future is uncertain. After having spent nearly a decade building Bullfrog, Peter Molyneux decides to get back to what he loves best, making games. In 1997, he founds Lionhead Studios and begins to build his team. This time, all the problems that we've had in the past we can get right. We have got to 
create some great original ideas, some ideas that have never been attempted or created before. Peter founded Lionhead with the intention of keeping that family um, atmosphere, keeping teams together and passionate about their projects, not big company politics and being part of a machine. The name of the company is chosen in an unusual manner. The name of Lionhead is another thing I'm not particularly proud about. We originally wanted to call Lionhead Red Eye. And it turned out that Red Eye, just about every company in the world is called Red Eye, and we couldn't call it Red Eye. So we panicked and thought, what, what the hell are we going to call ourselves? Because we've got these journalists coming, we can't say the company with no name. And that's where Mark Webley, my business partner, who always come, always saves the day, says, hey, why don't we call it after my hamster? He's called Lionhead. Mark then went to go and check on the hamster, who turned out to be dead, in his cage, stiff with rigor mortis. And you know, we thought, well, we can't change the name now. He's going to be the journalist is going to be here in five minutes. So we are named after a dead hamster. Work begins on Lionhead's first game, one Peter hopes will achieve their lofty goals. The first game, Black and White, was really the foundation stone of what, what we wanted Lionhead to become. Some amazing technology, some working with some incredible people. What Peter has brought to the table in a lot of his games is sort of uh, moral ambiguity. We're your conscience, good and evil, yin and yang, black and white. In the sense that you have an environment where you can do really good things or you can do really bad things. Black and white is obviously the ultimate extension of this. But the unusual nature of the game made it a tough sell once again. I heartily object. That's just malicious. It was a really hard concept to sell to publishers. It's a bit like what Populous was in the early days. So I was sinking my own money into it, which I was absolutely, completely happy to do. But of course, I've always been terrible about predicting dates. I can never imagine that a game is going to take more than two weeks to develop, let alone four years. And that's how long Black and White took. And all that time, Lionhead was growing in size and becoming more and more of a financial burden. It became, in the end, almost a replication of what the early days of, of Bullfrog was in a bizarre way. He wants to revolutionize the industry with every single release. You know, if we did everything Peter wants, I think we'd probably be here for 10 years working on this game. Well, the result of that is you'd end up with amazing games. Because he is so passionate about doing something that is so different and so special. It's a monument to you as a god. And so we eventually we released it, and it was a pretty nerve-wracking time releasing that game. You know, there was a lot behind it, but it was enormously successful. Wow! We got lots and lots of awards again, and it was featured in the Guinness Book of Records for the most, the most um, smart artificial life form. And, and, you know, there were wonderful things that happened with Black and White. It was, again, like those early days of Bullfrog. And just like Bullfrog, the game is a success, paving the way for several new titles. He went and makes people think and, and sparks the imagination. They say, can you really do that in a game? I smell combat. It just explodes from there. It kind of comes back to his ability to innovate and show you what you want to play. Work begins on several new projects. Fable, a game that offers players the freedom to become whatever character they want. I'm really excited about Fable. You're starting to get into this world of RPGs where the things that you do as a player dramatically impact the game. And that's really what an RPG should be, right? The role that you play affects the game. It's very exciting. It's, it's the future, and it's, it's right in front of us. BC, a game that makes you responsible for the well-being of a small tribe. Peter would, was talking to me about it once, and, and he just cracked me up because he was kind of like, he kind of looks at me and he goes like, yeah, you know, this part of the game, you know, it's just kind of like Super Mario with blood. BC, you have a tribe, you know, you want to have the tribe grow, which is by getting them food, shelter, you know, all the kind of classic Neanderthal things you need to do to live. And the movies a game that allows you to take on the role of a movie mogul and guide a studio into the big time. But no matter what games he works on, Peter Molyneux helps the player realize that the choices we make have consequences, both good and bad. What a lot of Peter's games have done is just to say, well, you're whoever you want to be. Here's the playground, here's the sandbox, you know, make of it what you will.
I asked him once what made him stand out. He once told me that people, when they have an idea, have a little voice in their head saying, maybe it's not a good idea, maybe it's not, maybe this isn't the best thing to do. But he doesn't have that voice, so what he'll do is he'll think of something and he'll just hang on to it and he'll just evangelise that idea. And I think Peter likes to push the boundaries. Sometimes you think, my God, how are we going to achieve these things? But he has that kind of vision that sort of above and beyond where we are today. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Molyneux. In March of 2004, the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences gives Peter their Lifetime Achievement Award. The guy has taken games and done things that we just never really expected. And sometimes it's like, oh, that's a cool idea, lightning strike once. But, you know, will it happen again? And, and he always seems to do it over and over again. You know, he's an innovator. Computer games are completely my life, and um, I just would be a road sweeper without them. Thank you very much indeed. You know the bizarre thing? I'm more ashamed of the mistakes that I've made or than proud of the achievements because some of the games that I've been involved with have been close to being really good, but not quite great. I think I'm going to continue making those steps forward. This is my life, my passion. I don't think I'll ever stop. I don't think I would know what to do with my life without making games. It's a fantastic, amazing, incredible job. I get to have a dream and see that as reality. What else could you do? The hottest gear.